course, he really didn't need to be here. And so it just shows you how, how serious he is about church. And then he said, well, you tell them I'll be there tomorrow night. So I want y'all to, uh, I want y'all to be in prayer for him that he is able to do what he needs to do, but he'll take care of himself. But the Lord just worked such a miracle because he has, he had a serious, uh, he had serious blockages, a lot more, they, his stents were blocked, and then he had some other serious blockage, and they expected, um, well, possible complications, and he just came through it really good, and his recovery, he's doing, he had a rough night last night, but he's doing really good. Uh, Pastor Jason had, had surgery, and they said it looked like inside his shoulder that a, a, a shark had chewed him up in there, uh, just the, the residual from those seizures that he had. But um, he is hopefully through the worst of his. He's had some severe pain that is expected with that, but um, he is now doing better, and we hope that we, we just need to pray that that will stay unfrozen because what happens is in going to therapy, they don't want to use it because it's painful, but then that particular type surgery is easy to freeze up, like that shoulder is easy to freeze up again, and we just need to pray that, that he needs his arms slinging when he preaches. You know, I don't think it's right. It just didn't right for just one arm to be moving. So uh, let's just pray about that. And also they had told him that his range of motion was probably going to be uh, limited. And I know that they told, um, we've had a, two or three that they've told that here. And the Lord has opened it up where that hasn't been true. And our God is still in the miracle working business. He is as real here, he's as powerful here as he has ever been at any time, in any place, with anybody. It's not like we're the great, 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 great grandchildren. We are his first generation children, and he has never been at any time more powerful than he is right now. So I'm going to be talking about that today. But it's so good to have each and every one of you. We are, we are primed and set for a great weekend I just truly, we've asked the Lord to visit us in a special way, and I think he desires to do that. Um, I, it has, I have found that if I get desperate, then he does respond. I have found that if I have kind of a laissez-faire uh, approach, and if I'm kind of, you know, I need you, but you know what, I've got some other options if you don't come through attitude. You know what I'm saying? Like, Lord, I'm praying for this headache, but if you don't hurry up, I got something in my little, my little bag in there. You know, if we've got that kind of approach to God, then I've found that he often just kind of lets us row our own boat. But I am desperate for a divine interruption. I want a holy invasion. I need him in my life. And I'm going to be talking to you about that today, and I'm thrilled to be teaching, actually, um, uh, Brother Kleinitz was here, and out of, of politeness, uh, I did ask him yesterday if he wanted to teach this morning, and he said, oh, that's okay. I think he could see my face. I wasn't, I, I had something I <laughs> wanted to teach, and it's been a while, so I'm just thrilled to be teaching for you today. I want to be teaching on uh, divine interruption. You know, what you're, what you're hungry for, the scripture says, you shall be filled. But I have found that that's not just a scripture. If you hunger after something, you are going to be filled with that. It can be good. It can be bad. You hunger after cocaine you're, you're, or that particular high or whatever you, you chase. You hunger after a career. What you'll do is fill your life with that. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be satisfying, but it means that what you hunger after, you will be filled. You hunger for something long enough, you know what? You're going to find it. You hunger to be single, you'll find a way to get divorced. You hunger, you hunger after something. I can remember Murdy Fitzmaurice, that's uh, April's uh, and Ricky's mother and father. She said, our greatest, our dream house became our biggest nightmare. She said they had thought about building this particular house that had so many acres and they could have fences and they was going to have these uh, horses and, you know, I don't remember what other type of livestock. And she said, we dreamed about it and it was going to be two-story. And she said, most of our 
our marriage at that time, she said we were drawing plans and we were thinking about, you know, how the bedrooms are going to look and everything. And she said, so we set out to do that. She said, we found fault with everything, everywhere we lived, because it wasn't that dream, ha dream house. So she said they worked and worked and worked and worked, and they finally built that dream house, and we had Bible study in their dream house, and we were amazed by it. I'm like, man, this is so awesome, man, this is so cool. I love the porches, I love the backyard, I love the fences. She said our dream house has become our biggest nightmare. She said we're fighting to pay for it, we're fighting to take care of it, we're having to work extra hours to just pay for all the upkeep. And she said, then on the weekends, you can't do anything but take care of this nightmare. She said, we're looking to downsize. <laughs> what you hunger for, you will be filled. And I'm going to tell you, I have to set a, 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 almost a time in my timeline. I have to set these flags that say, Donna, whether you know it or not, you don't know what's going to come on the horizon tomorrow. And Donna, whether you know it or not, you have no idea what your calendar is going to be like in a couple weeks or this next year. Donna, you need to get desperate about seeking God before you have desperate times. It is an immature Christian, and I know I'm speaking to a committed people that come here on 930, but it is an immature Christian that waits until crisis to get desperate before God. It is a mature Christian, and believe me, I'm not the epitome of a mature Christian. I'm working on that. But it is a mature Christian to say, you know what, I'm going to desperately seek the Lord. Because I need his direction in my life. I've learned enough in life to know that when I think things are going fine and dandy, the next thing you know, the whole apple cart can be turned upside down. You got that little island that over there they were singing uh, whatever they were doing, playing with their, I was almost saying uh, their ukulele and I was thinking of Hawaii. That was a wrong place. Uh, South America, wherever that was, over there in Mexico. And then suddenly out of nowhere comes this typhoon, then this hurricane, then it's the biggest hurricane that had ever been in any time in history. And it was going to flatten out that whole area. And they were running and running and running. And everybody's all in the turmoil. And, you know, so they're all in turmoil. And the next thing you know, they say it hit the mountains and somehow the mountains just kind of undid it. And I mean, you just don't know. One minute you think you're safe, the next minute you think you're doomed for death, and then the next thing you know, something else happens. My husband worked for a guy in one of his great career, <clears throat> bivocational career jobs that he had in uh, Mississippi. He was a car salesman. I have a picture, and that picture reminds me he wasn't there long because he was not, no. No, <clears throat> they told him he was going to have to lie about cars, and he said, I can't do that. And they said, well, you will never be a good car salesman, so y'all beware, beware of car salesman. But anyway, he had this guy that he really, really liked there, an older man that uh, kind of was just a wonderful, he had tons of quotes and uh, really mentor kind of in life, a life coach. But anyway, he told my husband, he said, let me just tell you something about life. He said, don't try to get rich. He said, because every time you think you get rich, he said, then you're going to be poor. He said, every time I thought I was going to get rich, he said, then something happened. And he said, and I was poor again. He said, and then I thought, man, I am poor and I'm going to always be poor and something else would happen and I would get rich again or I'd think I was going to get rich again. That's kind of the way life is, isn't it? And I just have come to say today, we need the divine direction of the almighty God. I don't know what the future, what your future holds. I don't know what your health holds. I don't know what your kids hold. I don't know what the future of this church holds, except I know who holds our future. That's what I know. And I am, I am desperate today to hear from heaven because if he knows, he's wanting to share his secrets, but he shares secrets to those who seek him. Um, I, I I don't know that I got these, this story exactly right. Jathan is sitting here, so it's a story about a man, that, and it happened at their church. But I remember the gist of the story. 
uh, Jack was a man who had uh, lived a full life, and he had done exactly what he wanted to do, and he, I guess he smoked what he wanted to smoke, drank what he wanted to drink, and he liked he liked his language and he liked his little lifestyle and so now he is older and he goes in for I believe some type of surgery goes in for surgery and he wakes up and his wife he is desperate to be baptized and to go to church and so his wife is like what in the world has happened to you and so he starts to reveal that during his surgery he had this visit uh, almost into eternity and he felt like he was going down this dark tunnel or this dark, uh, dark, well, dark tunnel of some sort. And as he's sliding down of this dark, dark tunnel, he realized that it was hot. And he realized that that was not the place he was wanting to go. And his words were, I am not going to hell. I am not going to hell. And kind of at the last minute, he said, he was pulled from there and he woke up. And let me tell you, we may not, whatever it takes, no matter how desperate. We may not need that desperate of a divine disruption, but I am praying that God, the God of heaven, will come down and arrest us wherever we are, course correct us wherever we're going, and let us know He is in control and He is in all power and He does have a plan for our life and we are important to His kingdom. Uh, this happened, Saul of Tarsus experienced such an encounter in Acts 9. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was suffering threats from it with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requests letters. He's all excited about arresting Christians. <clears throat> and even to the fact that we know that he was the one that held the coats for those that stoned Stephen. And so he's requesting letters addressed to the synagogues in uh, Damascus, meaning that all the Jews, uh, he was making sure he had these letters for arrest, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any of the followers of the way or these new apostolic Christians that he found there because he wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. Now, you've got to get a picture of that. In those days, they did not have uh, cop cars and arresting wagons and such, but here you would have people on horseback and you know this is where Paul is he saw he's on horseback going to Damascus and he's going to bring these Christians back and they're going to be walking chained all the way from Damascus to Jerusalem so here he is and he is so excited salivating about that and he's dreaming he's dreaming he's sitting on this horse just dreaming about him and I'll tell you what I'm gonna have me about 50 they're gonna be lined up I'm gonna be having I'm gonna be having them sing I'm on the chain gang I'm, I'm gonna have them they're gonna be they're gonna be I'm gonna teach them how to sing about Jesus I'm gonna I mean he's just fantasizing about all this evil that he is going to do and he's doing it thinking that he is protecting Judaism. So here he is, you know, just dreaming about it. And suddenly the Bible says, <clears throat> as he's approaching Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly shines down on him. He falls to the ground and he hears a voice speak from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Talk about divine disruption. How about spiritual arrest from heaven? He's going to arrest people, but Jesus decided, you know what, I'm just going to arrest you. How about that? I'm going to arrest you. I'm ready to be arrested from heaven today. I, I don't know what this world's going to do. I don't know the direction of our, our presidency or our economy. I don't know what we're going to do about guns and, and kids shooting each other. And I don't know what we're going to do about the drug issues. But I tell you what, heaven has answers here today. And they've got answers from my life. I am ready for a divine and a spiritual rest here today. So he's knocked off of his beast by Jesus Christ. Don't ever think he doesn't know your name. Don't ever think you're just one in the crowd. He knows exactly who you are and what you're doing. <clears throat> and he is able to give you a divine arrest today. So he's knocked off his beast by Jesus, and he's into the dirt. The light's blinded him. A voice is thundering from heaven. And then he says these words, Who are you, Lord? And, so, and the voice said, I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting. Now get up, go into that city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men of Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but they didn't see anyone. So Saul picked himself up off the dirt. Then he opened his eyes, and he was blind. So his companions had to lead him by the hand. 
I think God just did a little of that for extra emphasis. It's like to humble him with his arrogancy or arrogance, to humble him so that he would be stayed in a prepared state where he could remember that God needed to do some work in his life. I have asked the Lord over these last couple of weeks, I said, God, whatever it takes in my life, do not let me wander down a path that is not directly on purpose. I mean, there are times when you go through seasons where you do, you know, you go through those, those seasons where you just kind of are moving along and you don't hear a lot. You just are living out of discipline. But I'll tell you, I am hungry for God to give me, I, I want, I know that God wants to feel hunger. And I know that God wants us to hunger after him. And I'm going to convince you of that today. But I am hungry for that today. So anyway, he goes, he remains blind for three days, didn't eat or drink. I guess not. He's fasting. He's serious. He's like, my God, give me some relief here. Now, there was a believer in Damascus called Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, said, Ananias. He says, yes, Lord. The Lord says, go over to the street called Straight, to the house of Judas. And when you're there, ask for a man called Saul of Tarsus. He is praying for, to me right now. I've shown him a vision of a man called Ananias coming in, laying hands on him so he can see again. And this is what Ananias says. But, Lord, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done. I know this guy. He's authorized by the leading priest to arrest people like me. And it's, this is a ruse. This is a ploy. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to go over there, and he's going to arrest me. But the Lord said, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. Let me tell you, when God divinely disrupts your life, you are not the same person. And you know, we are, we, this, this Jack, this Jack, such a wonderful, Jathan did teach him Bible study, and he was faithful to church. And he, as far as I know, still going to church at Life Point Ruston. And this man is faithful. Let me tell you, he didn't forget that dream. He didn't forget the divine disruption. He became a different person. This is when God does something in your life, you are moved into a different dimension. You no longer talk the same. You no longer see the same. And I'll tell you, I found out, and I'm gonna, this is really what this lesson is about today. It may be your initial time when God disrupts your life and suddenly that you're, you're hungry to be, walk in a different way and talk in a different way and see in a different dimension. But let me tell you, that won't be the only time in your life when you're going to need it. There's going to be junctures and seasons of your life that, that when you get hungry, He's going to come and meet you again and He's going to do a work of grace in your life again and you're going to say, thank you, Lord, again because I'm not the man I was last week. <clears throat> he was in the same city, but he had a different agenda. He had the same ministry talents, but he was using them in a different way. So I'm praying for those supernatural, what maybe you would call defining moments. I found two de definitions for defining, mo defining moments. They say that a defining moment can be that moment where something happens where it reveals your true character. But there's another definition for divining moment. It is, they said it is those, uh, Mel Swartz describes it as this. It's this burst, sudden burst of clarity where there has previously been static. There is an epiphany of movement. There's an aha moment. It is often a significant event or an incident, or I will say today, it is a place where you can pray, you can hunger for when God will meet you there. It is a significant incident that creates change in a person's life. It is a point at which a situation is clearly seen in a different way. And it starts a chain of events toward powerful change. Defining moments direct our lives into new pathways. They are born of an illuminating insight and an expanded awareness. Are you, are you hungering for expanded awareness today? It doesn't matter how old we are. I'm telling you, God wants to be real in my life where I am today. I'm praying for these supernatural defining moments, these encounters with our God that reshape our mind, rearrange our priorities, restructure our schedules, remake our hearts, reformat our thinking, 
remodel our marriages and our families. Because I want to tell you, when you change, then the things around you start to change. Like, I want them to change. Well, how about you let God change you and then watch God do the other change? Reform our weakness and rewrite the next chapter of our lives. I want him to redesign my future today. Not my will, but thine be done. What do you see in heaven for my future? You created the world. You did a pretty good job of it. We're still amazed by nature, aren't we? then can he do a work in my life? I'm telling you, I'm tired of messing up my future. I'm tired of messing up my life. I want him to do that work in my life. We are all lost today, feeling in the dark without his guiding hand, aren't we? But our conversion isn't the only time we need a divine disruption. There is never one single season that we have all the wisdom we need to navigate the complexities of this life. Just try it. (laughs) You'll see where you find yourself. Oh, God, help, help. No signal, no signal, no signal. Lord, now I need you. Can't hit 911. I don't know what we did before 911. We made it, didn't we? I don't know what we did before cell phones. I don't know what we did. We made it before uh, even the cassette recording on your phone. I don't know how we lived. I don't know how we communicated. We did, didn't we? Yeah. (laughs) Yes, we did. So here Paul is praying to do the will of God. He tries to move forward. Now, this man now has been moving in ministry. He's been seeing great results, and he's been following after God, and he's been praying for God to do his work in his life. And so he's been moving forward, and he's been feeling really, really good about himself. And I don't know exactly why God worked this way with him, but I love the way Paul processes this. So, he's trying to go to this country. It says, Acts 16 and 6, Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time. Then coming to the borders of uh, uh, Mysia, they headed north toward the province of Bithynia. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to go there. So instead, they went through Mysia, whatever, to the seaport of Troas. That night, Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in the northern Greece was standing there pleading, come over to Macedonia and help us. So we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, concluding the Lord is calling us to preach the good news. When Paul had this disturbing dream, it forever changed the course of his future and the future of the church. If Paul hadn't have gotten desperate enough to get a hold of God till God invaded his dreams and then he responded to those dreams, then we would not even know the history of the church as we know it today. It was because of this that God, those history says, that the door to the known world was opened wide open because of this one dream of a man that he had that changed the course of his life. And he said, well, you know, I was wanting to go over here and I was feeling the will of God to go over here and I was wanting to go over there and I was trying to go here but you know what God what do you want me to do and so the Lord invaded his dreams and he said you know what I'm going to do what God says do I'm going to go to Philippi and when he went to Philippi there was nothing there but a few women praying out by a river and you know what he said God said go and this is what we're going to do and you know what he did he started ministering to women and he baptized a few women and, and the next thing you know, he's creating such a havoc in the city that they arrest him, and guess what? He is back on his knees again. Well, not really his knees. Let's look at Acts 16, 23. He finds himself again in a mess. And when they laid many stripes on them, they cast him into prison, changing the jailer to keep them safely. The reason why is because every time he would get a jailer, he would witness to the jailer in such a... a a a profound way that he would convert the jailer and they were afraid that the jailer was going to let him out. So that's why they're switching jailers here. Who having received such a charge thrust him into the inner prison. So he says, I'm I'm, I'm the the big bad jailer, right? I know what I'm going to do. You're not converting me and I'm going to put you in the inner prison. And it said, and their feet were fast in stocks, meaning that they weren't moving much of their body. So here you've got the jailer who is the big bad jailer of all jailers. 
and he's got them in the worst place in prison. Their backs are, are uh, broken open with, and no doubt, dirty and, and everything else from all the beatings that they've had. 25, but you cannot bind the praise and worship of a bleeding heart that has a hunger for God. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Their hands and feet may have been bound, but their heart and their mouth was not. They began to sing praises about at midnight, and they weren't shy about singing either. The Bible says the prisoners heard them. And guess what happens to that, that big, bad jailer? Well, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loose. Let me just ask you, are you in a season where you're bound today? Are you needing a prison break today? You know what? Then let's pray for divine disruption because God of heaven is able to do whatever we need him to do. If you're hungry, he said he will fill it. I'm going to tell you, we have impossible situations that are hurting us, that are we're desperately seeking answers, and we need release. Let me tell you where we can find it. We can find it when we get hungry for God to disrupt our situation. Well, don't let your fear and pain imprison your mouth and your heart. So many times the devil convinces us to be quiet and to kind of go into this uh, mully grub and, uh, you know, grumbling and why, why, why situation when that's the worst thing we can do. If you're bound by a life situation, then open up your mouth and start to praise and worship. And let me tell you, heaven is going to come to your rescue. Notice all the prisoners were freed that night, and I think that's kind of funny because you got Mr. Big Bad Philippian Jailer who is now trembling, the Bible says, and he's like, you know, oh, God, I'm fixing to die because, I'm, you know, the whole prison's open and y'all are going to be, y'all are free. And they said, oh, no, don't worry about it. We're not going anywhere. Let me preach to you. I, I'm just being frank with you. I'm not that spiritual. I would have been running for my life. I would have said that God has delivered me. You go fend for yourself. I'm out of here. That's what I'd have said. I'm sorry, I, but not, not, not the apostle. Not Apostle Paul. No, he stops right there and says, no, we're, we're fine. We're fine. He says, let me just preach to you. So he started preaching to him a while, and he didn't preach to him long because he said he takes them to his house, this Philippian jailer, takes him to his house, and he preached to all of his house. And during the night, the same night, they're all, the Bible says that he, he uh, uh, washed his wounds and he bound up his wounds and all that. And then he baptizes them and the whole family at midnight. And when it says baptize, it wasn't just saying baptize in water, but they were baptized with the Spirit too because it doesn't differentiate here. They were baptized with water and Spirit and born again in the middle of the night when I'd have probably been running out there saying, man, I'm glad we escaped. God avenged us. No, Paul's looking for an evangelistic opportunity. I love that. Anyway, so they went. I got to tell you the rest of the story, and I got to finish. But anyway, they go back to jail, and so they're like, "No, we, we you know, lock us up, lock us up." And so they all locked up, and they're all acting pitiful, you know. The next morning, so uh, they they find out the, the dignitaries find out. My God, there's been a jailbreak, and there's there are people gone everywhere. But that lo and behold, uh, the apostle Paul and Silas are still in jail. Now, we don't know exactly what's happened, but we need to get them out of here. They are spooky. They got something that, that we need to get out of our town. We got to get them out of here. So they send word and say, uh, we, you are released. You're released. And so Paul says, no, we ain't going nowhere. They publicly beat us. They publicly humiliated us. You tell them that they've got to come in and get us, and they got to march us out in front of everybody. And they sat there until they forced the dignitaries to come in and bring them out. And they said, the Bible says they said to them, please leave our city. Please leave. Please leave. Anyway, I just love that. Had to tell you that. Are you ready for a praise break today? Let, let's have, instead of having, instead of having just a meltdown in our situation, why not have a jail break? You know how you have a jail break? You have a praise break. That's what you do. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now, later... Paul finds himself in a different situation. He is in prison again. He's a prisoner again. He's on a ship, and he's in the middle of a storm. 
The storm was so severe that they feared that everyone was going to be uh, lose their life, and they kept just uh, throwing things overboard, and the uh, winds just kept battering the ship, and they kept saying, oh, my God, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. They threw everything on, overboard. Are you in a stormy season of your life? Don't know what's going to happen next. Seem like you're in control, don't know, then you don't know what you're going to do about your job. I'll tell you, I want to ask special prayer for our pastoral team right now. Their jobs, um, well, Pastor Jay's job situation is different just due to his situation, but uh, I know that our other pastors, they are battling. Their, their, their bosses are sending them off on, you know, these. they're having to fly out during the week. They're sending them uh, you know, just having them work extra. Just, I, I want you to pray for our pastors because I want to tell you, God knows exactly what he's doing in all situations, and he knows how to take care of those that are his. But I'll tell you what he expects us to do, to go to him in warring prayer. That's why we call Wednesday night war on the floor. When we get desperate before God, I have watched God change job situations in this church where people could not get off for church. I have watched God change those situations where family men that were working on weekends now could get jobs making better money working during the week. We have got situations from leaders in this church that their job situations are aggravating and tormenting and making it difficult for them to spiritually lead the way they want to lead. I think it's time we go to God in war prayer and see God turn this around in Jesus name in Jesus name well this is how Paul handled it all right Acts 27 he has a red hot prayer session in the middle of all this storm here he is he's you know he's unfairly treated he's a prisoner he's uh, in the uh, in the, the across the sea and but he has a prayer session with who nothing but the maker of the wind I, I, you can never go to a place that God's not in full control. Sometimes it does feel like he's not in control of our country, but I assure you he's in control. I assure you he's in control. We don't know the big picture, but I'll tell you what, we've got to have a world that's ready for the coming of the Messiah. We've got to have a, a world that's ready for the Antichrist. And let me tell you, if we, we're in a mess, we are in a mess. But let me tell you what he did. He got a hold of the maker of the wind. He decided, you know what, I'm in a ship and I'm in a, you know what, I need some divine disturbance. Acts 22, Acts 27, 22. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the Lord to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone that's sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe, Paul said, I believe God, and it's going to be just as he said to me. It doesn't matter where your storm, how bad your storm is or where your storm has taken you. He knows you and he knows how to find you right in the middle of that storm. It may be chaotic to you, but he knows those that are his. He's got your name written on his heart and on his hand and on his forehead. And let me tell you, he knows how to find you in the middle of the storm. But I ask you today, are you hungry? Never fear, never fear. Now notice the storm did not cease. If you read, the, sto the storm began to continue, but, f but Paul had found his peace. Even though the storm does not cease today, God can give you peace. I am hungry for those supernatural intrusions today that change my mind. But I'm going to tell you, mentally, you can have a, 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 a mental, you can have a mental uh, release that happens. That the Bible calls it peace that passes all understanding. It can be a peace that does not make sense. It's a peace that I have had to find because of the situations my husband and I have found ourselves in where you really do not know. I felt the water up here, and I am just paddling with all my might. And suddenly I said, God, I have had all I can do. I don't know what else to do. And I begin to really call out to him. And I literally feel him lift my body out of that water. And I feel him carry me. I'll tell you this uh, last three weeks in uh, Singapore and Malaysia, we felt the undergirding power of the almighty God just carrying us. It's, it's, it's that, that's that feeling, that supernatural stamina that God God can give you that what you're going through, he may not relieve that. He might do it like the jailbreak. 
He might release you completely, but sometimes he will give you peace in the midst of that storm, and I am desperate for that today. Only God can give that. Now, uh, this is the same guy, and, and uh, you know, Paul, you know, here, here Paul, uh, Paul is, uh, finds himself in a situation where he don't have Silas. He don't have anybody to praise and worship with him, and he don't have a companion, but he finds his place to pray until God speaks to him louder than the storm. It all depends on our hunger worship. Today, I just want to ask you, these, we're going to have our service today at 1045. Are you hungry to hear from God? Tomorrow night, we are going to meet here again, and we are going to seek the Lord. I am asking you as an individual, I would call your names if you, there weren't so many of you, but are you hungry for God? You might feel you're on top of the world right now. I am telling you, the world spins. When you think you're on top today, we're going to get that call next week, next month. Oh, God, help, help, help. Let me tell you, today is the day to be hungry. Today is the day to get a course alteration, a course correction. Today is the day that we say, my kids need you. My kids need you in their future. The greatest gift my parents ever gave me is teaching me how to get a hold of God and how to live for God and how to raise my family in church. That's the greatest gift I can leave for my children because I don't know what's going to happen with my little Scotty. But I tell you, I know a God who is able to take care of my Scotty. Let's look at this scripture, Mark 6, 48. This is my ending scripture. And he saw them toiling and rowing. For the wind was contrary unto them. About the fourth watch of the night, he comes. On November the 1st, 2015, he sees them toiling and rowing. He sees the winds in their life that are contrary to them. And he comes at 1045, walking on the sea. And would have passed them by. I often wondered about that, except I found the solution. He will not intrude into your life until you call out and say, Lord, here, how about me? Lord, I desperately need you today. I sent some hungry hearts here today that are going to hail the master of the storm today. I just feel it in the Holy Ghost. I've been hearing some sounds. I've been here having some people talk to me. And I've been having different ones come to me at prayer meeting and say, you know, I'm just hungry. I'm hungry for a divine disturbance. I, you know, I'm hungry for God to do great things in our lives. I'm hungry for the Lord to do it. We've been having such great preaching around here. It's been stirring our spirits. Let me tell you what that preaching does. And that teaching on Monday night, it stirs up some things. It takes that, I saw a vision a, a few months ago of God coming down. It was like a big and this is crazy, you know, but it was like a big pot of gumbo and, and he said, I want to stir from the bottom. He said, you know what I've been doing? I've been stirring kind of from the from the top. You know how you do? You, you'll dip that gumbo from the top and it just don't have a lot of that good stuff in it. All that good stuff goes to the bottom. But the Lord spoke to me and he said, I'm desiring to stir you, Donna, from the bottom up. I want to go down in there and get that good stuff out. I want. I feel the Holy Ghost through the preaching, through the preaching that's been going on around here and the teaching. It's been stirring. It's been getting us hungry. I've been hearing voices saying, "You know what? You know what? The Lord is stirring me. The Lord is uh, Lord is stirring me up." And I've been I've been hearing great reports about that. But I, I'm feeling today. Today, this weekend, can be the kind of the the uh, the gasoline that's on the fire. The you know the the stuff that we've been praying for, the stuff that we've been preaching about, the stuff that we've been working toward. I just feel that there are times and seasons where God shows up in special ways, and I just we prayed for that, and I believe He's going to do that. Now I ask you today: How hungry are you? How desperate are you in your life? The word says if you're hungry, you will be filled. If you're thirsty, it will be quenched. How hungry are we for his divine disruption? Are we starving? Are we desperate? Then don't let him pass you by today. You know how you know? It's reflected your hunger level. 
It's reflected in your worship. It's reflected in your prayer. I can remember when conviction got a hold of some of you and you couldn't wait to get to the altar. How about that hunger getting a hold of you today? That same hunger. I can remember when you first got the Holy Ghost, how you couldn't wait to worship. It didn't matter what kind of songs they sang. It didn't matter what kind of beat it was. You just couldn't wait to worship. You just couldn't wait to clap your hands because it came from a heart that was burning and fueling. How about let's just worship today because he is Lord. How about let's worship because he's master of the sea. How about let's just worship because he's walking on the water to us. How about let's just worship because he is Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's stand right now. Lord, I'm hungry for you. I feel a hunger in this place. I feel a hunger that's been stirring for the last couple months. And, and there's been some great things that have been happening in the spirit that's been leading up to this. And, Lord, we have people that are desperate for you today. I know I've got my hands reached out. I don't know what my future holds. There's so many questions I don't have answers for. There's so many situations that I have no control of. Lord, I desperately want my grandson to be completely healed. God, I'm desperate for that. I'm desperate, Lord Jesus, for you to give me direction for my life. And Lord, I'm desperate to see you work in the lives of these precious people that have been so faithful so long, that have brought this ship to where it is today. And God, you see the economy we're in, and you see the battles they fight on their jobs and you see the, the battles they fight with their health and I'm, God we've got our hands waving today we've got both hands in the air and we're waving Lord we, we're hungry for you and I pray Lord let us go into this next next service and let us let us reflect our passion let us be like Paul and Silas and doesn't matter what we're going through let us open up our mouths and our hearts and let us worship you with our whole heart Seek you in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. I receive it. I believe it. I just want to say we're going to have guests here today. And let's remember it's not just about us either. We create an environment of worship. Guess what? It, it rubs off on them. Stephen just told us that Brad, my husband's therapist, came at Mother's Day. And he said, told him yesterday, he said, I've never felt God like that in my life i got to come back to that church. He said, if people come to that church and say they don't feel nothing, they're lying. <laughs> Let's have church today. God bless you. <laughs>